As investing legend Charlie Munger says, you don't get rich from buying or selling, you get rich from sitting on your assets. So it's easy to get caught up in trying to find the next hot stock or potential 10, 20 bagger, or on the contrary, even seller stock uh, that is either down or has been moving sideways for a while. But there's various pieces of evidence that, that show the majority of the time these actions are detrimental to portfolio returns. Actually, any action or activity can be detrimental to portfolio returns. And what really allows investors to outperform and build wealth is buying and holding ownership shares in businesses that can either internally compound their intrinsic value or distribute cash to their shareholders for them to reinvest as they see fit. And the key word here is compounding. Compounding obviously being the eighth wonder of the world is what causes outstanding results over time. But for compounding to actually take place, you need to not interrupt it unnecessarily. That means holding on to your investments for a long period of time without touching them. And this is much easier said than done. In reality, uh, the daily, weekly, and monthly, even yearly news and fluctuations in the market can distract you from what's important, which is you own a stake in a business and the quoted price of the stock is not a measurement of true value. So what I see as the key ingredient to getting around this issue and being able to control your mind and hold your investments for a long period of time is conviction. Now, conviction in your investments is earned. It's not given. So to gain conviction, you need to do a lot of research, analysis on a company, understand the business model, understand the addressable market and the customers of the business, assess the management team as well, uh, and then doing the impossible task of trying to predict the future. But how I get around this uh, with my portfolio of stocks is one, ensuring I run a concentrated portfolio. It's tough to have uh, true research-backed conviction on 30 stocks, especially if you have another day job as well like I do. And then also these businesses need to be in markets that I can uh, understand and businesses that I can understand. But more specific to the actual investment process, it's ensuring I have detailed but easy to understand uh, long-term thesis for the investment and I actually document that. And then third is investing with a margin of safety. That means uh, the stock price sits far below the value I place on the business. That way, even if my thesis proves to be wrong, I'll still do okay and have a peace of mind that my investment will do okay. And one bonus factor additionally to this is finding smart investors with the same investing strategy who own uh, the stock as well. If you can find their thesis, that's even better. But that's more of a reinforcement. You really you know, should be doing all of the things yourself to gain a true conviction. So I thought it would be good to run through uh, some of my highest conviction positions while summarizing why they're high conviction and how this allows me to be focused on uh, holding for the long term and benefit from compounding. Hopefully this will help you guys uh, look at how I get conviction on a position, how I look at a business and how I look at some of my holdings in my portfolio. And hopefully it'll also help me uh, reinforce a lot of the conviction that I do have in these businesses. So there's an alignment of interest here. So why don't we start with my highest conviction bet, which also happens to be the largest position in my portfolio. And that uh, business, as you may have guessed already, is Alibaba. So the summarized long thesis for Alibaba uh, is underlying economic growth in China and the rapidly increasing internet economy, which has contributed to Alibaba growing at near 40% over the past five years. These tailwinds still exist, but so do, more importantly, some more industry-specific secular trends such as the uh, rapid development of cloud infrastructure to meet internet demand in China, digital commerce growing in the double digits still, and hundreds of millions of Chinese people rising to the middle class in the next four to five years, which will give the country a much higher GDP per capita and increased purchasing power for individuals. And because of these secular tailwinds that are behind Alibaba as a business, I'm most focused on three areas of their business, and that being uh, e-commerce, the core commerce section. This is the cash cow part of the business that produces around uh, 35 billion in EBITDA annually, and that's essentially earnings before interest taxes and amortization. So cash profit, and it's still growing. Next is Alibaba Cloud, the largest cloud provider in China, growing at near 50% uh, CAGR, and also starting to contribute towards profit now. Uh, lastly, Ant Financial, China's largest payment platform with Alipay and being a fintech company, loan business. Alibaba has around 30% equity stake in Ant Financial and has started to earn sizable profits from that in the past two quarters. So with these 
three core parts of the business. I believe Alibaba's growth will quite reasonably be in the range of 20% or above for the next five years. This is also with the possibility of a margin expansion. Now, you might be thinking margin expansion, their margins have been uh, contracting for the past sort of three to four years. But what I'm on about is uh, the 35 billion US dollars that the core commerce marketplace produces uh, being used to fund the other loss making areas of the business like cloud, like the digital media assets and, and some of the international uh, initiatives. At some point, these loss making parts of the business will either be profitable or shut down. And the segmented profit number, that 35 billion, is almost double what the group's reported operating income is today. So alone, that would be around a 30% margin on the revenue today if we just take that marketplace commerce um, EBITDA. And in other words, you know, they could shut down all other areas of their business except core commerce and the marketplace. And they'd essentially double their reported free cash flow or earnings from where they are sitting today. So that's what I mean when there could be easily a margin expansion in the future. So that's the high level thesis. Um, how do I also have a margin of safety with Alibaba, which, which will enable me to hold the stock for the long term, even if my thesis starts to play out differently than I've just laid out there? Well, I won't go into the valuation in too much detail, that's just my opinion, but with the stock selling at only 11.6 times core commerce EBITDA and giving guidance to hit 145 billion of revenue in 2022, which on that hypothetical 30% underlying profit margin is around 43 billion in underlying uh, cash earnings, excluding the impact of those growth initiatives. You know, that is insane. At this price, you're buying a business that's growing above 20%, 25% even, for a single digit PE. And I estimated based off a distribution of scenarios that Alibaba's intrinsic value could be anywhere between $225 per share to $300 per share. And it's currently you know, 40% off the middle point of that distribution, meaning even if the bearish stance on China remains and Alibaba uh, don't hit their growth targets, we still end up with a very good result and meet my hurdle rate of return, which is around 15%. Now, the next company which carries a similar thesis to Alibaba is Tencent. And this is actually a smaller position than I'd like it to be at the moment, but I've no doubt I'll add to it in the near future if the prices stay where they are. And the summarized thesis for Tencent carries you know, the same macro factors as Alibaba. So I won't spend too much time on that. That's the underlying economic growth, rapidly expanding internet economy and middle class, as well as things like cloud and fintech growing faster than in any other region of the world. And Tencent covers you know, almost all areas of the internet in the internet economy. Uh, and that's social media, payments, digital ads, gaming, cloud, just to name a few. These are all areas of the market that are set to expand at double digit rates over the coming years, maybe even above 15% as an average. And, and Tencent really is the controller of that entire ecosystem, you know, meaning that it should take the lion's share of that growth. And it's shown its ability to spawn into new areas and scale them rapidly, you know, in the event that some of these uh, core areas start to slow down in the future. What's more is that you know Tencent's operating segments are obviously highly profitable, growing fast and undervalued by the market based off my opinions. But what really separates the thesis from Alibaba's uh, is the huge investment portfolio that they have in some of the most promising companies in the world. Translating this over to a margin of safety, Tencent's EV to EBITDA is in the region of around 18 times, which you know, admittedly is very cheap. But additionally to that, I haven't done you know, the calculations because it's almost impossible to do that at this point. But if you look at the earnings power and underlying profit of some of the companies they own equity stakes in, say such as C Limited, 30% share, uh, JD.com, Pindordor and, and Tesla and, and more, you, know, you could reach a single digit multiple of operating and equity earnings versus today's market cap, which is you know, quite remarkable for a company that's growing as quickly and as consistently as Tencent. So the recent sell-off has given investors in Tencent a very nice margin of safety. I estimate the fair value to be around $71 to $90 per share, depending on uh, which reasonable scenario plays out versus you know, a stock price today of 60%. So that gives us a margin of safety north of around 20 to 25% based on already conservative estimates of what their future may look like. Again, this means if my thesis is wrong and growth slows and we see no multiple expansion, maybe even you know a slight retraction, still I'll still earn a decent IRR over the long term. 
which I'll define as say four to five years. Now I'm gonna try and get through these next ones quickly uh, so I don't spend too much time on this video. The next company I have a high conviction on in terms of you know, at least my initial investment and holding it for the foreseeable future is Facebook. Again, similar to Tencent, I would like this position to actually be bigger than it is, but there's the possibility that I'll add to it in the near future. And my average for Facebook was down in the 220s, but I'm still very bullish on Facebook's long-term prospects. Facebook is a cash printing machine that operates you know, a duopoly in the digital ads market with Google. It's a business with one of the largest moats I have ever seen. You know, this makes me very comfortable about being a long-term owner of the business. And additionally, you know, to this, they're, they're in a market that's growing its spend over 10% per annum, that being the digital ad and targeted ads uh, business, which is a huge tailwind for the company. Plus, they have some valuable assets such as Messenger and WhatsApp that are yet to even be monetized. So that's a catalyst in itself. And I feel the profitability of the company is also very much underappreciated. Yes, they have 42% operating margins, which you know, it's fantastic, but if you look deeper, they also spend 20% of their revenue on R&D every single year, which is, you know, seen as a growth spend. This is money back into the business to develop their product offering. And if you just take half of that R&D spend out and place it into, say, owner earnings or back into operating income, you get an operating margin that's around 53%, you know, and an income number that's around 60 billion US dollars annually, taking it close to the likes of Google in terms of uh, its value and Google is obviously valued at around two trillion dollars today as a market cap. So, looks like Facebook could have some way to go even still. And you know, with my average of two twenty, I'm getting around a six percent earnings yield at the moment. And in five years, you know, that earnings yield could reach fifteen percent. In ten years, maybe even twenty to twenty five percent. Meaning, if growth stalled, the company could return fifteen to twenty percent of my investment annually through a buyback or dividend, whilst most likely growing earnings per share and the intrinsic value of the business at the same time. So that's not something you can easily find, especially in today's market, and it will meet my hurdle rate of return with quite some ease. You know, when I bought Facebook initially, I valued the business at around $310 to $320 per share, which was based off quite conservative assumptions about their five-year future. But they far exceeded my initial expectations, meaning you know the true value uh, is probably much higher than my initial calculation. And as a reference, they're already on track to beat my 2023 estimates for revenue and earnings by the end of this year. Meaning, you know, the thesis is still very much intact. If anything, I wasn't appreciating Facebook enough, and that's probably visible in. Uh, my position sizing not being big enough either. And so for all those reasons, I'm very happy to hold Facebook for the long term. And in fact, I'd love to see a 30 to 50% drop so I could buy even more. Now, the last company we're gonna cover that I have high conviction on as an investment is Micron. I recently did a video on Micron, so you can check for more detail there. But essentially, the thesis for Micron uh, at a high level is they operate in a historically bad market and seen as bad by uh, investors. A lot of people have had a bad time investing in Micron in the past, and that industry is the semiconductor memory industry. And it was bad mainly due to it being fragmented, full of unintelligent competition, and that created supply demand imbalances that really affected all of the businesses in the industry. And essentially, due to various reasons, such as competition being reduced to only three players, which makes it now an, an oligopoly which is obviously very powerful for pricing and things like that. It also contributes to sensible levels of uh, supply and most importantly, more unit demand than there's ever been before in this industry. So my thesis is Micron should not only be able to grow its sales by two to three times by 2025 uh, from where they are today, but also they should become less volatile in their results and cyclical in nature, which would contribute to maybe even a multiple uh, expansion or just you know, a stagnant multiple from where they are now rather than the reduction we see at the top end of the cycle. So in terms of margin of safety, my average for Micron is around $47 per share. So I'm already up around 55, 56% in less than a year, but I valued Micron at close to 90 dollars per share. The price today is still you know, some way uh, off of that. So there's still some room to run, at least in my opinion. I think analysts have this stock at a price target of around $115 to $120 per share. So they're even more bullish. But you know, there's more upside potential even than, than that. Realistically, Micron could reach 20 to 25 billion in pre-tax income by 2025, which even at a modest PE 
uh, say 50% contraction from the PE today, get a PE of 10 on that, that's around 200 to 300 billion in market cap or around 176 to $320 per share. So there's a lot of room for the stock to run and, and potentially if my thesis plays out, I could be on for a 5X in five years. Needless to say, based off of that thesis, I'm very much willing to let it play out over the next few years, not touch it, uh, considering my margin of safety. Now I'm gonna start wrapping this up, but first I wanna explain why this is so important for me to have this long-term conviction in some of these positions. And the main reason is these four positions alone, where I have this conviction, they make up over 40% of my portfolio, which means 40% of my portfolio can be left there just to compound and help you know, drive my returns over the long term without me needing to worry about stock price movement or keep track of the weekly, monthly movements in the market. There is, of course, a number of other businesses in my portfolio that I'm highly convinced of that I haven't been able to mention today. Some you know, smaller and carrying maybe more upside potential, but maybe have a bit more risk and uncertainty involved. But really, these four that we've just gone through, Edge it in terms of solid, crystal clear, uh, easy to understand thesis and a high margin of safety. And I believe if you can get to a point where 40, even 50% of your portfolio is in concentrated, high conviction bets, then you're in a very good place to sit on your assets and let compounding do its work. That's about it for this video. Thanks all for watching. I'll be leaving all of my valuation models on the companies mentioned with uh, price targets on the Patreon page for all the patrons and Discord members. Uh, a link will be in the description for any of you who are interested and would like to go and check out uh, all of the benefits. You'll get you know, these DCFs as well as uh, access to my recent buyers, sells, a watch list of stocks and target prices as well as a private Discord chat. So check that out if you're interested. Other than that, Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments below what you think uh, of all of the stocks mentioned and the thesis I gave. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Good luck with all of your investments.